So there was a man who died and went to heaven. And up there he met St. Peter, and St. Peter took him on a little drive down golden streets. And they passed these great mansions and castles on both sides of the road. And finally they came to this little run-down shack, and so uh, Peter directed this as the man's place where he was going to live. And so the man kind of thinks about that for a minute and says, well, hey, we passed all these places here, these great mansions and castles. Isn't there anything better here for me? And Peter said, I did the best we could with what you sent. <laughs> it is a live studio audience. Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. I'm going to share uh, four statements with you, and if any of them fit you or your experience, um, please nod demonstratively. No one appreciates anything I do around here. I feel invisible to the people around me. This is a waste of time. I know I said that this week as I got called for jury duty. And lastly, after all I have done for you, this is the thanks I get. So if you nodded to any one of those, then somewhere in your life, you are an unjoyful giver. You are unjoyful probably because we can become unjoyful when we are giving to the wrong God. There's a woman who we read about in our gospel reading who was actually a joyful giver because she was giving to the right God. She was giving to a God who actually allowed her, allowed her the joy of giving to him. It is this woman who poured perfume all over Jesus. And I want us to, to take a look again at that verse, at that passage um, that we'll find on page five. It's a passage from the, uh, the Gospel of Mark. And, uh, and I want to look at verse three there at the very beginning, where it says this. While Jesus was in Bethany, reclining at a table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of nard, pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Now, this lady here is able to give joyfully. Now, as she's doing this, Jesus doesn't push her away or, or, or tell her that, oh, that's too much. In fact, other accounts of the gospel says she didn't only pour it on his head, but all over his feet, and the fragrance filled the entire house. So, so Jesus didn't prevent her from giving the gift or say, oh, give it to somebody else. Instead, he allowed her to enjoy giving to him. Mary, this woman, had the right God. A God who allows us to enjoy, to be joyful in our giving. As we talk about giving this morning, I have set before you two visual objects. One, an offering plate, which represents giving to God. And then two, this cup, which represents giving to the poor or giving to any charitable organization or, or thing that, or cause that is meant to help people in need. In our reading this morning from the gospel, Jesus is actually making a distinction between one, giving offerings to God, or two, giving to man. Now some of you may be thinking, wait, 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 Tony, doesn't Jesus say that when you have done this to the least of these my brothers, you have done them for me? Well, yes, he does, but he is still making this distinction between our offerings and our charitable donations. Here is what he says in our, in our passage this morning in verse 7, if you would look at that with me, verse 7. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, 
but you will not always have me. You will not always have me. And what Jesus is saying is that, yes, by all means, help the poor, and they will always be here to help, no problem. But there's a difference between the poor and me. Poverty is not man's greatest problem, but losing me, Jesus, your salvation is. Jesus is also saying is that there is definitely a person named Jesus who is a historical figure in history. A person who was actually here and an individual who made an impact in the world. And then after dying, rising, and ascending to heaven is no longer present with us in that way. But 2,000 years later, the poor are still with us and we have many opportunities to help them. So I take you back to 2017 when my family and I were coming back from travels out west and we had stopped, I believe, in Gallup, New Mexico. And as we had stopped there, there was a man who came up to us and asked us for some money and we said, well, we're at the Burger King right here so we'll get you something to eat. And then we got him some food and I went off and left my family there at the restaurant and went to the gas station to get some gas for the car and then while I was there, two other guys approached me for money. And then when I got back to the Burger King, my wife came up to me and said, you know, the guy we gave food to brought in five other guys all asking for something. And so I said to her, honey, let's go. Let's get out of here. The poor you will always have, but you will not always have me. See, giving to man means that we are giving to a temporal need that will never be satisfied. When we're giving to man, we are giving to a, a need that will be fed today, but tomorrow gone. And when we're giving to man, let's confess, very often we're giving to ourselves, this man. We're giving to our own need for recognition, our own need to, to feel good or to look good in front of others. We're giving to perhaps our, our own need to repay a debt or a, deed or, or a need for us to enable, enable a codependent. Very often we're giving to our own personal need to feel like we are the savior. When we give only to man, we will get only man's reward, but not the reward from heaven. And ultimately, when we're giving only to man and just to man, we're giving to sinners who will possibly dishonor the gift that we have given us and that we've given to them, and we then become unjoyful givers. So I'd like for us to imagine then that this, this woman um, who is anointing Jesus with this perfume then taking her perfume and giving it not to Jesus, but putting maybe a $340 bottle of Chanel number no. five into that poor guy's cup. Or to try it this way, the disciples estimated that what that perfume was probably worth in that day was a year's wages. So at minimum wage here, that would be about $18,000. Imagine taking $18,000 and putting it into that poor man's cup. You might find that he may dishonor that gift by not using it only for food, clothing, and shelter, but a good portion of it going to, as researchers show, tobacco, alcohol, or drug use. This reminds me when I was a police officer uh, back in the days um, in Delray Beach, and there was a man that I encountered. He was a heroin addict, and he was homeless, and I'll call him T. Stevens. Now, T. Stevens was really a kind of a problem. I had to arrest him many times. He was very aggressive in his panhandling. And so one day he told me that he was hungry, and, and so I went across the street, bought him a sandwich, and brought it back. You know, T. Stevens never even took the sandwich from my hand. He just kept his arms folded and just sort of looked aloof and said, you know, just, just, just set it right there. I'll, I'll get it later. So when we give just to man, when we give just to sinners, we may find ourselves giving to someone who may dishonor that gift. We may find ourselves just giving to a need that will never be satisfied. We may find ourselves simply giving to ourselves and our own desire, 
uh, to be the Savior. But then there is giving to God. And when we give to the right God, he allows for us to enjoy our giving. Now let's be honest, everybody. It is certainly so much more appealing at times to drop something into that poor man's cup, isn't it? It's, it's meaningful, it's rewarding, it's, it's something that you can see something, someone, where someone's immediately satisfied. And so even the disciples seemed to think this way because as this woman was pouring this gift all over Jesus, they were thinking, wow, th that, that's a waste of all of this $1,800 worth of, $18,000 worth of, of money. And here's, here's what they say. Here's what they say, and we'll, we'll find that actually in, um, in, in, verse, in verse five. It says, no, I'm gonna go up to verse four. And it says, um, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than, more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. See, I wish the, the apostles could actually hear what they're saying. They're saying that giving a great gift to God, the Son, is basically worthless. It's meaningless. And so there are times when perhaps we feel that way too, or at least others in our world will certainly criticize us for giving to God the greatest gifts. Some of those who may actually criticize us or judge us or accuse us from giving, for giving to the greatest gifts might be, let's just say, our boss at work who thinks your time is better spent working for him. It might be your coach, a coach for a student or your youth, who thinks that their talent's better used for, used for the team. Or it might be members of your own family who think that your, money's, your money is better used in taking care of their needs. I remember a time when I was a kid being kept from doing a church service project because I was told that my chores at home were more important. When we give only to man, we sometimes find ourselves being accused or criticized or even judged by man for what we would want to give to God. But today, we have a God who actually allows us to enjoy or to be joyful and giving fully to him. Now, as we find ourselves walking this gauntlet in life of people who accuse us, who criticize us, and judge us for what we're giving, we come to the altar and find a God who allows us to enjoy that moment. And there are three ways that I would like to share with you today and how God allows for us to enjoy giving. And I want you to take out your pencils that you may find there in the, in the, in the hymn racks there. And I want you to underline a few phrases and, and statements from our passage this morning. So, so first of all, I would like for you all to, to take a look then at verse 6 there, right? And underline, leave her alone. And underline, why are you bothering her? What I want you to understand by this is Jesus speaks up for his people. He speaks up for those of us who wish to give to him. He speaks up to us, speaks up for us against the voices of those satanic ones who would criticize us and accuse us and judge us. Jesus defends and protects us. He speaks up for us. And so then, I would also like for us to look then at uh, the rest of that verse there where it says, she has done a beautiful thing for me. Underline that. She's done a beautiful thing for me. And also go to verse 8 and underline, she did what she could. Brothers and sisters, Jesus stick, speaks up for us, but he also values our gift for him. It may be the best that you can bring, but Jesus values it and says, it's beautiful. 
Jesus values what you give to him. And then let's go to verse 9. And I'd like for you to underline where it says, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Underline that. What she has done will be told in memory of her. In verse 9 there. Jesus speaks up for us. He values our gift, but he also remembers. He remembers your faith. He remembers your love for him. He remembers your gift that you've shared with him. He remembers the faith that you express that he is Lord. We have a God then, the right God. When we give to him, we find that he speaks up for us, that he values us, and he also remembers us. As a pastor, I actually experience this a lot because the gift I often like to give to God, what I think is the most precious gift, is all of you. Very often, I will use your gifts and talents as I try to proclaim the word of God to other people. It may be gifts of speaking, reading, or singing that I like to share with other people. But I have sometimes endured criticism for those choices. One particular time was at my previous congregation when I had asked a youth who had a known difficulty with speaking to actually give a testimony in church. But after he gave it, even the leaders and all the people who were anxious applauded him and said how beautiful his testimony, his witness of Christ was. In Jesus Christ, the right God, we actually have a God who allows us to enjoy giving to him our gifts. He speaks up for us, he values us, and he remembers our faith unto eternity. You see, we can believe that Jesus is God for the very reason that he talks about how he remembers this woman here. Wherever this gospel is preached, what she has done will be told about her. So this morning, I preach that gospel. I preach that gospel so that you will know that Jesus is the right God to whom we give. I preach that gospel because Jesus Christ, who was rich, became poor so that in his poverty, you and I might be rich. I preach this gospel so that you will believe that Jesus Christ, that body, is worth our best gifts and treasures. Because this is what Jesus says. This woman has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for its burial. What this woman understands and what she is doing is she is prophesying, she's preaching with her gift of perfume that this body will be given to take away all of our sins. And so we preach when we bring our offering. We proclaim that Jesus is the right God and he is worthy. We proclaim that he gave up his wealth in heaven to live with us in our poverty that we might be rich. We proclaim that Jesus is God. When we hear the word, we believe. The woman that we're talking about who anointed Jesus with perfume, John identifies her in his gospel. It's Mary. No, not Mary Magdalene that you always see in the movies, but Mary of Bethany. Mary, the sister of Martha. You know, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead. This is the same Mary when Martha was so busy with all the preparations, sat down at Jesus' feet and listened to his word. Therefore, she believed. This is the same Mary who heard Jesus by his word command her brother Lazarus to come out of the tomb alive. 
Mary heard the word and she believed that Jesus is God. You also hear the word that's preached and you believe. And because you believe, you give your best gifts to the right God, to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Perhaps one of the best gifts that I have seen as a pastor was one day when a little boy, about four or five years old, who I had baptized, actually sent to the altar a little picture that he had drawn during the sermon. It was a picture of Jesus that he had drawn with some pencil. And so I included that with all the other offerings on the altar that day because it was beautiful. This four-year-old, five-year-old boy heard the word of God and he believed that Jesus was a God and worthy of his gift of art. So we, like Mary, hear that word, that word that helps us to believe, that word that raises the dead, and we believe in Jesus as the right God who allows us to enjoy giving. Therefore, because you all believe in that Jesus Christ, because you all believe in that God, then you give. We give to the body of Christ. We pour our offerings onto his person. Where is he? Right here. He's all of you, all of us. This, everybody, is now the living, breathing body of Christ onto whom we pour our fragrant offerings and love and devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you give to this body, you really are giving to the poor. But what you're giving to the poor is not a gift that spoils, perishes, or fades, but it's one that lasts forever. What you're giving to the poor is the body of Christ, the body of Christ that God has used to ransom all humanity from the grave. And yes, when you give to this body, you're giving the kingdom of heaven to the poor in spirit. And you are filling those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. When you give to this body, you're actually giving to a mortal body who may not always be here. Like Pat, or Corrine, or now Elmer. See, back on December 7th, about 34 of us gathered in this room to go caroling to people in our church who were poor in spirit, poor in health, and grieving and hurting. And as we went to their homes and to their nursing homes and into their rooms, we poured out on them our fragrant offering of God's word, prayer, and yes, his message of being born into our world, into our poverty, that we might be rich. And one of those we visited was at the Life Care Center in Tamarack, Elmer Medley. What we did not know at the time was that was going to be the last time that we would see him alive. And as we all squeezed and crammed into that room, we shared with him the offering that we give to the body of Christ. The fragrant word of a gospel of a Jesus Christ who was born to save us. It is that gift that never spoils, perishes, or fades that we gave to one who we might not always have here on earth with us, that he might live forever in heaven. Because you believe, then, you give. And you give joyfully your offering to this body of Christ. Today, we hear Jesus making a clear distinction between donating to the poor, but worshiping God with our offering. It is so much sometimes appealing and rewarding to actually uh, give to man, but as we give to man, we are giving to those who may not always honor our gift. We're giving to a sinners and people who may criticize us and judge us for our giving to God. 
But when you give to Jesus, everybody, it is never wasted. You are pouring your love and your faith onto a body that is worth your salvation and your soul. You are believing in a God that you have heard preached through this gospel who allows for us to fully enjoy giving. Giving to God, giving to Christ, and giving to one another in Christ. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.